Content warning. Religious censorship, disease, including the coronavirus, raunchy sexcapades, and, uh, urination. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. Most noble and illustrious drinkers, and you thrice precious pockified blades, good friends, my readers who peruse this book, be not offended whilst on it you look. Denude yourself of all depraved affection, for it contains no badness nor infection. Tis true that it brings forth to you no birth of any value, but point of mirth. Thinking, therefore, how sorrow might your mind consume, I could no after subject find. One inch of joy surmounts of grief a span, because to laugh is proper to the man. Welcome to What Mad Universe, a podcast about pulp and the origins of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Philip Rice, and with me as always is Adam Prosser. Hello. <clears throat> uh, today we're discussing the oldest work featured on this show, uh, Gargantuan Pentagorel, the 16th century French series of five novels by Francois Rabelais. I know we say this a lot, but... Uh, this one's a weird one. Uh, the story, such that it is, follows the adventures of two giants who rule over the country of Utopia. Yes, that's Utopia from Thomas More's book, published just a few decades before. Uh, a note, we read the English translation by Sir Thomas Urquhart, later finished by Peter Anthony Motier from the late 17th century. Uh, there's controversy about this version as the language isn't an exact match, and contains many additional flourishes um, that sort of draw upon Rabelais' style. Uh, but uh, this is the public domain version, so it's what we read. So, yeah, Phil, I, before we go any further, I just I did want to ask about that. What, how is it, when it says finished by Peter Anthony Mottieu, what is Oh, it? Uh, he only did, uh, I think, the first two or three books. I see, okay. And, but and the... then another person finished it. Oh, okay, I, I, I get it. And I know that um, I'm probably going to talk about this later, but the the fifth of the five books, there's some question other, as to whether Rabelais himself wrote uh, it. Right? Yeah, um, it's a lot shorter than the others, and it has uh, stylistic differences in a lot of it. Um, it's generally agreed upon that Rabelais had, you know, fragments written, and somebody else went in and hastily sewed them together. Right, and it, and it has and put in the, bridging the, bits. Right, and and the note I saw said also that they seem to have stolen a lot of bits from uh, what was it the uh, a bunch of older Roman and Greek works and just kind of reworked them. Uh, bit, yeah, right? it mentions Lucian's true history. I didn't right. notice that, but I might have. It might just be language things rather than events. But right. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Philip is uh, adapting Lucian's true history into webcomic form or has been doing that for a while <laughs> um well i take you a long break because i'm busy with other things but yeah i have the first volume uh uh done uh, it's also on comicsology so mm -hmm. hopefully i'll get to finish that right but you know Lucian's not that lucian history. finished it but <laughs> right that's right yeah you you're just keeping in and it sounds like rabelais never really finished his thing either that is that this is actually something I'm a little curious about with Rabelais because he um he he was writing around about the same time as uh, Miguel de Cervantes Don Quixote and I'm always heard de, de, uh Don Quixote sort of listed as the maybe not the first novel but it's kind of the 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 cornerstone of what became the what we would think of as a novel rather than 
I guess before that it was, it, you know, it was just uh, fragments and, and um, random writings. and uh, Or longer poems. Yeah, and, and I mean, you notice that with this story because it's just kind of like the, the quote, first book, Gargantua, which is actually the second book, I guess. Um, it just kind of stops at a certain point, right? He just keeps telling yeah. weird incidents and then he just comes to the ending and goes, and now let's talk about Pantagruel, basically. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, actually, um, a, a Czech writer named uh, Milan uh, Kundera um, uh, said that this, along with uh, Cervantes, was the or that Rabelais, along with Cervantes, was the founder of the entire art of the novel. Right. Okay. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The the and they're both very episodic stories, both uh, Don Quixote and this. Yeah. Yeah. And this has a lot of, uh, as you said, uh, asides and um, uh, just cul-de-sacs that don't go anywhere. <laughs> he will stop and do an entire chapter on whatever he felt like talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of lists. Right. Yeah, lists. Like a lot. <laughs> he just uh, goes on with like synonyms for what he's talking about. It's weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, even as late as uh, Moby Dick... Uh, there are chap. There's book. The book is like that. Like Moby Dick has all these chapters where he goes off on like cytology or whatever he feels like writing about it. Yeah, random. I think um I haven't read it, but apparently Les Mis does that as well. Right. With history. Well, and and I know that in the case of Dickens, uh, that was sort of a case of a being paid by the word and b, you know, doing it in installments and putting out a a chapter every month for people to buy for a penny or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure if they had the same setup for a story like this. Um, no, no, no. Um, Rabelais wrote this on his own um, uh, volition. Um, it was actually uh, some of the later ones were actually banned. So he definitely wasn't uh, banned by who exactly? Um, the College of uh, Sorbonne and the Roman Catholic Church uh, condemned his work. Hmm. Well, that and. Um, uh, let's see. Um, he entered into the protection of the powerful uh, Du Bailey family, um, who petitioned King Francis I to allow him to continue publishing. Uh, then Francis died uh, in 1547, and the sale of his of the fourth book in this series was banned. Um, yeah, he apparently uh, was repeatedly condemned by authorities and threatened with uh, heresy trials and things. Hmm. and uh, only survived due to uh, having wealthy benefactors. Huh, interesting. I didn't I didn't know. I mean, with France, you always hear that they're a little more uh freewheeling. They're not as uptight about that kind of stuff, basically. Uh well, this was 16th century France. And... Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, the mere fact that he's writing this stuff and it's uh, you know, it's it's entertaining people just to write about all this blasphemous and body stuff right like it's yeah it's getting um but he was there was pushback of course yeah no significant I get pushback it. well as you say i can i can believe the the roman catholic church was uh not too happy about it obviously uh, yeah rabelais was actually a friar at one point right um he uh was originally um a part of the franciscan order uh he uh left because uh it was controversy by uh other uh, monks, um, you, they were sort of harassing him over the directions of his studies. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, yeah, Rabelais I read, was also. Fr I read one that said um, they didn't. He studied Latin, and then he wanted to study Greek. And apparently, at the time, uh, yeah, that that was part of it. Yeah, uh, that was his frustration. He wanted to study Greek, and they had uh, banned the study of Greek due to uh, Erasmus's commentary on the Greek version of the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> Very specific. I didn't look reasons. into that, but that's yeah, you know, one of those somebody had a problem with the doctrinal thing, so the entire language is out of bounds. <laughs> oh my god, that's see, that's wild because you know, like in religious studies and and any kind of uh, serious study, when you go to like the Victorian era, for instance, it was always considered well, you had to know Latin and Greek. That was the foundation yeah. of a good education. Well, this was just the uh, Franciscan order, uh, and that's why he left that, and he joined the Benedictine order. Okay. Um, and then later he left the monastery life altogether and entered into the study of medicine. Hmm. And uh, he wrote these books in his spare time as uh, pamphlets. So he was a uh, uh, sort of 
he was he was literally a renaissance man then basically uh yes yeah. <laughs> this was during the renaissance yes right um the character of gargantua actually wasn't original to these stories um it's a folkloric thing um haven't been able to find much information on it it's apparently celtic yeah uh but the first literary appearance was in the anonymously published french story uh the great chronicles of the great and enormous giant gargantua uh usually attributed to francois Giraud, uh whose name appears in acrostics near the end so it's probably him hmm. um uh it was published just uh, a short while before rabelais made his version um, I haven't been able to find a copy of this in English. There's a French version for sale, but um, I don't speak French. Um, it's much different from this. Uh, it's actually set in Arthurian times. Uh, like King Arthur's a character in it. Um, in the story, Merlin creates two giants using a spell involving whale bones, Lancelot's blood, and Guinevere's fingernail clippings. Uh, the giants immediately mated and conceived Gargantua. Uh, who then grew up to uh, serve King Arthur for 200 years in battles against the giants Magog and Magog, as well as armies from other countries, using a 60-foot iron club. Uh, and he was eventually taken to fairyland by Morgan Le Fay. Right. Which does happen in this book, too, right? Yes. Yeah. And Yeah, so some elements like that and uh, the names of Gargantua's parents, uh, which were Grangousier and Gargamel, Okay. Uh, not the Smurf character. Yes, right. um, uh, spelled differently, but yeah. Uh, well, that's I'm not that's sure. Sig the that's significant because so Gargantua does sound somewhat Celtic, somewhat British, whereas Grangousier and Gargamel and even Pantagruel all sound French. Uh, Pantagruel is apparently also a, a mythological thing. It's some sort of demon. Okay. I'm not from... sure where it's from. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, go, sorry, carry there's, on. There's not a lot of literary references to it. This is sort of the first time right. that got popularized. But I just, I um, just etymologically, not that I'm an expert, but from what I can tell, Gargantua, that does sound like a, a Celtic name, as opposed to all the other names, which do sound French. <laughs> so it does, uh, yeah. it does sound like that's, uh, I can buy that it was a Celtic uh, creation. And they love giants in uh, celtic folklore as well of course yeah, yeah. uh and for those uh gargantua doesn't inherently mean giant that's a word that was popularized because of its association with this right and that previous story yeah i figured as so much the idea of gargantuan uh meaning giant is from this rather than the other way around right right yeah i, I figured as much yeah but that's how it caught on rabelais sort of uh obviously read this book it's uh referenced at the in the intro to um uh, Pentagrel, which is the first book. Um, Pentagrel is actually uh, Gargantua's son, which uh, Rabelais made up. Like I said, the name comes from elsewhere, but he made up the character. Yeah, well, he has a whole. See it. He has a whole. Um, like he has the lineage of Gargantua, where he talks about the whole, the whole ancestry going all the way back to, uh, like the flood, like Goliath. And yeah, all those there's um, yeah, the uh, the uh, what was the name of the giant in the flood? Well, whatever it was. Um, but in well, the this, Nephilim uh, of the Flood are the, the characters of the ancient. Oh, yeah, but I mean, uh, the specific one in this story that um, manages to survive the Flood by riding it like a horse, <laughs> riding the Ark like a horse. Right, right. But he does, he puts, he puts all these, uh, all these famous giants uh, and monsters from folklore in, like, the lineage of Gargantua, basically. Like, he's got... Yeah, um, and... Go ahead. Including, I think, uh, a one named Gerg Magurg, which is, or something along those lines, which is a variation of Gog Magog, right. the uh, um, legend of the founding of England. And I mentioned Gog and Magog are giants in the previous version of the story. Uh, right. They're, of course, not associated with Arthur, but it's sort of, you know, yeah. playing well, fast Gog and Magog are, history. Are biblical. Yeah, they're, they're biblical. Uh, yeah, but uh, Gog Magog in the, uh, in the story is apparently, the word is unrelated to that. It's... It's um, it's Celtic, oh, like a, okay. a variation of a Celtic name. Huh. I know Polyphemus is listed as one of their um, yeah, their, uh, his ancestors, uh, who is the the Cyclops that uh, that Od Odysseus uh, you know, outwits. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, he basically crams every mythological giant you could think of into Gargantua's ancestry, 
um, and Pantera Girl's ancestry. Um, yeah, that was a fun bit. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, the first book is uh, Pentagorel and his uh, his birth and uh, youth and adventures. Uh, the second book is a prequel, so mm -hmm. it's an early prequel, um, starring Gargantua and sort of covers his youth and um, uh, and you only read the first two, right? Right. Yeah. He's he 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 conquers. I yeah. I only read the first two. He conquers. Uh, uh, what does he even conquer? He could. I don't remember them talking a lot about Utopia in the Garga in the book of Gargantua, uh, but maybe. I'm uh, no, it's mostly in uh, Pentagrel uh, that they talk about Utopia. Uh, we should mention that they're from uh, Utopia. Oh, I think I mentioned that at the beginning, but yeah, Thomas More's Utopia. Right. Uh, the capital city of Amaral is mentioned. That's from the original Utopia, mm -hmm. but otherwise, it's basically unrelated. Right. Yeah, and Utopia you for those. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Utopia is a, um, a book Thomas More wrote, uh, like I said, a few decades earlier than this, uh, in the late 1400s. Um, it's um, it means no uh, an place. idealized. Yeah, yeah, it means uh, no place. Uh, Thomas More was an expert in in ancient languages, so he made a lot of puns in the place names and names of characters. Um, in Thomas More's uh, book, which I did read, it was um, uh, set in uh, South America, uh, a peninsula off the coast of Brazil, uh, and um, the Utopians in ancient times actually carved out uh, the land in one place to uh, separate themselves from the mainland. Um, in universe, the the Utopia is named after their first king, Utopus, but. Uh, Obviously, there's an actual Greek version. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, though, actually, um, I recall in the uh, in Thomas More's book, uh, they're apparently probably, they're theorized to be descended from a Greek colony, so that would explain all the Greek names in it. <laughs> um, if you this book, uh, sorry? If you need an explanation for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, this book, like I said, is only sort of ostensibly set there. Um, they have a very different society. Um, in Thomas More's book, uh, they don't have money. Uh, gold is worthless for to them, except as um, a weapon to use against any invaders. So they sort of sow discord among the ranks of their enemies. Um, or pay off people, or that sort of thing. But to them, within their own country, it's worthless. Right. Um, in this, uh, everybody just sort of eats and drinks all the time and uh, right. dresses opulently and stuff. So, um, and of course, utopia significantly means, you know, a perfect society to us, but at the same time, it also means a place that can never exist or that doesn't exist, right? Like, it's it's sort of yeah. both of those meanings at once, which are significant. So it's not just a fairy tale land. Of course, everyone uses the phrase utopia uh, in conversation, but that was the intention right from the beginning, I think, for both of those mm -hmm. two things. Um, yeah, but it's sort of weird that uh, Rabelais picked that as a setting, but there's a lot of weirdness in this. So, <laughs> Well, it was, as um, you say, it had just come out, and it was kind of the popular uh, go-to fantasy land, I guess, right? He was cashing in on yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess there's a lot of cashing in, though he does go in different directions, so he's not just ripping things off, he's just sort of right. taking names and things from other people. Shakespeare did the same thing. Exactly, so. yeah. Um. So the third book uh, takes a weird turn from the uh, first two. Uh, it's basically a philosophical dialogue, like Socratic sort of dialogue, but a parody of it. Um, uh, Pentagoril's roguish friend Panurge, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, he, is, uh, he wants to get married, but he's afraid that he'll be cuckolded. And the word cuckold comes up so much in this book, I thought I was reading 4chan for a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, they say cuck a lot. Anyway, They probably um, don't even remember what cuckold means. They just say cuckold. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. Fair enough. But th this this book is very uh, concerned with, or right. at least Panurge is very concerned with it. So the whole book is him seeing various oracles and uh, seeking advice. And everybody tells him, all the oracles say... Uh, You'll have a bad marriage. You'll be cuckolded. Your wife will beat you and steal from you. 
um and um or they they say that they they say something you know that and everybody else interprets it that way and Panurge interprets it positively so like there's some sort of uh it, like a, there's a cryptic saying and everybody interprets it yeah. negatively but Panurge interprets it positively and this happens over the course of the entire book <laughs> just 300 pages of that it's very repetitive. It's them traveling um, from place to place and getting different information. No, right? no, not even that. That's uh, this sets off that, but no, they they just sort of go to various people. There's no travel really in this part. Oh, really? Uh, at the end, they decide that they're going to finally get an answer by going to the Oracle of the Bottle, uh, and um, the following two books, uh, the last two books, are about this voyage, which is sort of a Odyssey parody. Right. Um, or Odyssey, uh, the quest for the Golden Fleece. It's also got a lot in common with Lucian's true history and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it's that sort of uh, comedic going from island to island and weird things on each island. And then right. Eventually they go to the Oracle of the Bottle at the end. Yeah, the one um, I read about was they had some, the legal, the law cats. Try and try yeah, to the furred them. law cats. I don't know what that what they represented. They were just sort of <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't quite get it. It's probably something right culturally specific, but I couldn't figure out what they were supposed to mean. And they're and, sort of uh, giant monstrous cats. Yeah, they they well. Uh, from what I understand, uh, rebel and they try to you know put this into English, but Rabelais was using a lot of wordplay in French, uh, which of yeah. course is very difficult to translate into English, and he makes up a lot of words. Uh, similar to Shakespeare, uh, a, a while later, because um, of course, yeah, because Rabelais, like we said, knew a lot of Latin and Greek, so he, he made up a lot of words, some of which are still used in French, apparently. Right, but it's also I, like you can tell even now that it was supposed to, even through a translation, even through the archaic storytelling, that it was meant to be a bit ridiculous. Like, um, it's it's essentially, yeah. from what I can tell, the same as on The Simpsons, where they go, "He's in big and a stall with this cromulent performance." It's <laughs> basically the exact same thing. He just makes up these uh flowery ludicrous words that are sort of silly and entertaining in and of themselves but then they in some ways actually caught on right <laughs> and i think shakespeare mm -hmm. did something similar although with shakespeare we actually do use a lot of the words he invented seriously so it stopped uh, being you know... uh, well i think they do in france like in france exactly they use a lot of his words right so, right so, yeah just like like with shakespeare came up with uh what are some shakespearean words um What's an elbow from Shakespeare? Uh, yeah, there's there's tons. Like um, a lot of phrases, you know, uh, you know, neither a borrower nor a lender be, or uh, yeah, yeah, like I just tons of words and phrases were invented by Shakespeare, and we don't even notice anymore because they're so common. And it sounds like Rabelais was the same, yeah, in France, as you say. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I first encountered this story. Uh, I can't remember ex the exact thing I was looking up, but it was sort of just looking at magical lands in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, though it turns out this is used a lot in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but more as backstory than the actual thing showing up. Right. Um, the yeah. back matter to Volume 2 relates uh, the story about how Fr Paris got its name, which we'll talk about later. Um, yeah, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen has an entire giant appendix where he, he goes through all these uh, fantastical lands similar to this and then Gulliver's Travels by uh, Jonathan Swift and all that kind of story, um, you know, where, where that were satirical uh, voyages, mostly making fun of the Odyssey, I guess, uh, but that were also satires on things. And Yeah. Th um, in the League universe, it seems, or it's implied that the incompetent rule of uh, Gargantuan Pentagoril led to the downfall of Utopia. So hmm. that's fun. Um, uh, yeah, so the tone of this book, as we've mentioned, it's body, uh, but I'm not sure that really um, does it justice. It's it's filthy. It's um, very crude. Yes. Um, as I said in the promo to this season, there's a chapter that's just a list of things Gargantia wipes his butt with. Yes. That like, is it's just the one a list that does of tend to stick out. Because he literally yeah, talks uh, about it, and you and it, the thing is, he uses archaic terms, so you always kind of go, "Oh, maybe he's talking about something else." No, he's talking about wiping his butt. <laughs> yeah, uh, apparently the most pleasant thing to wipe your butt with is the neck of a live goose. Uh, so keep that in mind during this toilet paper shortage. Oh God, yeah. 
Uh, we're, uh, we're recording this during the middle of the uh, coronavirus thing, uh, hopefully towards the end, but probably not. Um, uh, yeah, Rabelais it's... actually wrote this book um, uh, during a um, – Europe had been plagued for 50 years with a syphilis uh, and epidemic. So, I don't know, it's sort of timely. <laughs> I guess so. This is like everyone saying uh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was in quarantine. So, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Rabelais wrote this while he was recovering. Actually, a lot of... Well, he didn't. I don't think he had syphilis. He might have. <laughs> <laughs> well, generally speaking, yeah, he was too witty to be to be to have syphilis. Uh, it decays <laughs> your mental um, faculties. Back in those days, it did, anyway. Oh. Um... But, uh, yeah, so um, uh, this text uh, resembles, in a lot of ways, uh, tall tales from America, like Paul Bunyan. Right. Um, uh, at one point, uh, like, it, a lot of uh, explaining how natural um, formations occurred or how places got their names. Uh, specifically, um, uh, at one point in uh, Gargantua, uh, he travels to France, uh, to the city of uh, Lacosha, which is the name given to Paris by ancient writers. Uh, Gargantua relieves himself, he pees, uh, and his pee floods the entire city, uh, drowning exactly 260,418 uh, 260, people. Um, and the citizens say, we are washed in sport, a sport truly to laugh at, or in French, Paris. Um, <laughs> Paris, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, which is uh, to laugh. So, yeah, that, um, yeah. That's, so that sort that's of... That's the origin. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another pl uh, one, I think it's in uh, Pantagruel. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he gets sick and he gets, uh, he, he has, you know, bad digestion. They feed him, like, diuretics and spicy things so that he pisses out the infection but it's boiling hot and it creates uh the hot sp some famous hot springs in paris at one point there's a lot of <laughs> urinating in this book <laughs> uh yeah yeah uh also uh oh you'll probably have to cut this out but i didn't know the word b was a word <laughs> well yeah it, it is that's how they translate it anyway um yeah um this is what was 17th century they translated this 18th century yeah 17th century right um so uh, there's also a uh, Bunyan story that I think probably draws directly on this. Um, in the Bunyan story, uh, there's a winter so cold that words freeze. And um, when, uh, the, when the spring came, they thawed and you could hear chatter for months from, you know, the winter. Um, this story, uh, Pentagorel Book 4, uh, they visit the um, Sea of Frozen Words. Uh, which uh, they can pull out, um, uh, uh, reach into the water and pull out ice that's uh, actually shaped like words. And when the words thaw, the sounds come out. So it's um, mm. um similar thing. That's also a, a thing in later League of Extraordinary Gentlemen books, but they sort of sure. interpret the sea of frozen words as like glacier-sized words. Even sounds a bit like a Yellow Submarine with the Beatles, some of that kind of things. The Sea of... Yeah. Not that specifically, but, you know, the Sea of Holes and things like uh, that. Yeah. It, it's, it is interesting because um, my understanding is that Paul Bunyan was created... He's not really an authentic old tall tale. Uh, I think there's some controversy over that. There is some... Uh storytelling basis prior so yeah it's it it, it's, it did sort of accumulate some tall tales of the old west uh paul bunyan as we know him was created by uh like he was created in the 20th century and it was kind of retconned into old tall tale like as if it was the old stories told by you know loggers and miners back in the old west i think there's some controversy over that because that's definitely claimed in uh the new in the uh uh, American Gods books, but I I've heard other opinions on that. Sure. So I'm not sure. Yeah, no. I, I what I what I think it is is that um there there definitely was a a a publisher that sort of uh formalized it in the 20th century, but they reworked a lot of existing stories that were yeah, around. Yeah. Um, um, and apparently a lot of elements like um uh like the stories of him creating the grand canyon or whatever apparently those were added later right and and it's also worth noting that um 
uh, in the versions of Paul Bunyan I read, they actually specifically mentioned that he was French or French Canadian originally. Uh, Paul Bunyan. Uh, uh, there's uh, an earlier version of Bunyan. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to talk this much about Bunyan. I did do some research on it a while back, but I don't have it written down here. There's a, there is a French Canadian like character, um, uh, Bunyan like character. So right. uh, it might have derived from that somehow. Well, I'm just saying that that, that draws a possible uh, link evolutionarily to Rabelais if it was French, right? Yeah, possibly. Um, of course, you know, uh, it would have needed someone who was literate to bring sort of Rabelais stories, and maybe they kind of, maybe they, they sort of. Uh, <laughs> they they trickle down into the uh into the culture of because uh, i there's certainly a lot of uh of uh, french canadian folklore that's quite wild that seems to have inspired a lot of the sort of wild west tall tale type stuff um mm -hmm. so i i do wonder if if there's a link there but of course i think uh as i say something like um uh uh gulliver's travels probably was an influence as well and and yeah. lots of other stuff um <clears throat> and speaking of similarities to other stories uh Listeners might recall our episode of about uh, the adventures of Little Bear and Trump by Ingersoll Lockwood. Um, one of the lands that uh, the Little Baron visited was the island of the Wind Eaters, uh, where the lack of food caused the people to learn to subside on wind. Uh, have you heard of breatharians? Apparently they, they claim to live on air. Anyway, um, uh, anyway uh, Pentagrel visited a similar place in Book 4, I believe. The island of Roche, Roche, I'm not sure, uh, okay. where people eat and drink wind. Uh, it says the rich have uh, windmills and the poor survive with feathers and fans. Um, and of course, Rabelais had to make it dirty somehow, so uh, they also eat a uh, her an herb that uh, induces farting. <laughs> he, yes, he liked farting almost as much as he liked peeing. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of lot of drinking, a lot of yeah, it's. It is what it is. Isn't one of the stories um, too that like, isn't uh, in the fourth book? Isn't doesn't he spend a long time talking about how they filled up on basically uh, the herbal equivalent of uh, of Viagra? That's the third book. <laughs> um, yes, um, there's a long uh, uh, a or a long couple chapters that just deal with um, a plant uh, called uh, pentagril. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, pentagrilion. Um, but it's basically hemp. Uh, it's apparently uh, a parody of uh, Pliny the Elder's description of hemp, uh, hemp okay. um, which included uh, uh, he believed there was a uh, variety that's fireproof. And um, uh, Rabelais sort of expands on that and makes it even more ridiculous. <laughs> um, and there's, uh, there's the implication that it's called that because... Uh, uh, Pentagorel invented a certain use for it, which is, I think, implied to be smoking it. So, oh, now I thought, but I thought they they had it as like a, like I say, the the, the equivalent of Viagra. <laughs> I thought that that was oh. how it was described. Again, I haven't actually read. Oh, it maybe I just... interpreted it wrong, but yeah, uh, somebody <laughs> does smoke it in the fourth book. So right. Well, I mean, they just that sounds like the kind of thing Rabelais would write from everything else that we've seen of him, basically. Um, uh, all the yeah, many, um, many... yeah, the word uh, Rabelaisian is actually a word, even in English, uh, describes earth, uh, displaying earthy humor, body, that sort of thing. Right. It actually uh, appears in uh, the Simon If stories, which we covered. Yeah, I mean, I've yeah, I've heard that as well, although... I always, you know, whenever you hear an author's name uh, used as a as a verb, uh, you know, you, you always sort of, uh, or as an adjective, rather, um, you always sort of say, well, okay, so it must have various elaborate qualities from his work. But apparently that just means if it's crude, it's Rabelaisian. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, there's a few other phrases uh, that derive from this. Um, this one I've never heard, but it would actually be useful in certain circumstances. Uh in French, it's called uh, Guerre Picrocholine, um, or Picrocholine War in English, um, hmm. named after uh, King Picrochol from uh, right. from the Gargantua book. He's the king of Len Lern, uh, and uh, he starts a war over, what was it, uh, bakers having, I can't yeah, remember I the was, exact details, but it was I, about cakes. That's exactly, I think that's actually the point, is that it's almost impossible to figure out what the heck they're fighting over. Uh, it's got some yeah. kind of, uh, some kind of uh, conflict between shepherds and bakers. 
uh, and fighting yeah. over who gets to bake their bread or whatever. And it just escalates yeah. into absolute nonsense. Um, uh, so this phrase is uh, refers to wars started for absurd or hard to understand reasons. Again, so, yeah. uh, Swift had something similar in Gulliver's Travels with the uh, with the the Lilliputians and the uh, Blen Blentathkuans, uh Blenescuans. Lethescuans? Yeah. They were the ones who, uh, and they were fighting over which side of a, an egg you were supposed to eat right like the wide egg yeah it said um because their scriptures said uh crack it on the appropriate side or something like that yeah exactly and and that was a parody of in that case he was specifically parodying like catholics versus protestants and religious wars yeah. but it's the same kind of idea of just a, a nonsensical war war how nonsensical <laughs> uh which the 19th yeah, century good thing nobody starts wars for stupid reasons nowadays uh <laughs> yeah no of course anyway in, in Europe, uh at that point, there's a lot of a lot of uh, fighting over you know doctrinal stuff and over minor cultural yeah. differences essentially. So that was a big uh, emphasis. Nowadays, we just fight over who's got oil. But anyway, <laughs> um, well, that was always the excuse, but it was probably for mostly to true. get new lands and yes, that is um, true. But uh, speaking, of Alistair Crowley who wrote the Simon F stories. Uh, Crowley uh, derived a lot of the elements of his religion, Thelema, from uh, these books. Um, in uh, Gargantua, uh, Gargantua founds a, a church called the uh, Abbey of Thelem, um, and uh, it has the uh, law, do what thou wilt. So, yeah. Yeah, it's clearly, and that is explicitly what in, inspired Crowley, right? Like, he, yeah. he, he saw, he read this book and was inspired by that. it's kind of weird because the book introduces that idea and i kind of per i have to say this was a hard read um it's between the archaic language and the plot doesn't really go anywhere <laughs> like the plot is no. not the point it's very much just here's a guy and he grows up and then he fights a war and the end like it's and and it, uh, the war is as absurd as possible um uh, and then gargantua ends with him founding the abbey of thelema as you say uh, and he, so he takes a chapter or two to describe it as, you know, the Abbey where, as you say, do as, do as thou wilt. And it's, it, it's clearly meant to be sort of blasphemous and shocking for the time. Probably one of the things that got him declared heretical because it's very much like, he basically says everyone will go in and have a lot of sex and <laughs> like, uh, yeah, will... uh, priests and nuns live in the same. Yeah. Like it, for once he actually tiptoes around it a bit, but he, that's clearly the implication of what he's talking about there and that everyone would just, you know, would violate all the various religious orders, different classes would all intermingle. There wouldn't be any class differences. What else is there? And he, he manages to, to, as you're saying, uh, he manages to take all the religious, uh, uh, doctrines for convents and reverse them like using wacky logic, basically. So, you know, yeah, it's... uh, there, there's a lot of that in the uh, various places he visits. There's uh, right. one I one place that's um, a, uh, a monastery with a lot of fornication going on. Um, and the monks uh, or the yeah, the monks uh, reply with monosyllables to all the questions they're given. Um, and there's also another island that's um, all the birds sort of mimic the um, uh, church order. So there's uh, right. there's cardinal birds and. Uh, one pope bird that be that comes from the cardinal birds, um, and uh, but sometimes there's two pope birds, and that causes the whole island to break out in fights, <laughs> which was of course a thing in the Middle Ages. There yeah. were a couple of times when there were multiple popes uh, fighting each other. But yeah, it's it, yeah. You also have to assume that you know you're, he's saying, oh, he's making fun of the church with all the fornication, but that may not have been completely uh, <laughs> made up. That might have actually been something that did happen from time to time. Well, he would know. He was a friar. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. And there's uh, there's a, one of the main characters is uh, Pentagoril's friend, uh, uh, Friar John, mm -hmm. uh, who's, um, he drinks and fights and um, really horny. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Yes, he's the yeah. He gets a, a bunch of chapters devoted to. Him. Did, did did they say he was the same character who was Prester John, or am I getting that mixed up with someone else? I didn't notice that, but no. it, my, they might have. There's a lot that goes by you, I think. Yeah, no, as I say, yeah. So it's very heftily written, like it's, and as I say, it's probably a lot of 
the stuff is being lost in translation that, uh, you know, it is, I, I, um, I th- yeah, the part about, um, uh, in Pentagoril when, um, Gargan- it says Gargantua was kidnapped and taken to the land of the fairies, uh, our translation said by, uh, Morg, uh, so I didn't notice that it was Morgan Le Fay, so it's hmm. a translation thing again. Right. And I mean, that is a British legend, which is interesting that they wouldn't, you know. Though the French adopted it, uh, the French introduced a lot of stuff to our Arthurian legends. So. That's true. Lancelot was French. Um, and yeah. even Morga- Morgaine and Morgaus are kind of French. Uh, Le Fay, that's a French name, right? Um, well, there, there's also a lot of uh, French influence in the language in general, but yeah. Because right. the Normans uh, invaded England and brought sort of French as kind of the as the the ruling this was of course long after the supposed time of king arthur's but the those stories are from you know long long after <laughs> the actual events of would have happened anyway uh and it was kind of about the normans from what i understand the normans uh uh writing themselves as these chivalric heroic uh fancy people uh and they were the french speaking groups who ruled england uh, so, yeah, uh, as you say, there's a lot of back and forth between the French and the English at that time. But it is just interesting that Rabelais was clearly taking a lot of inspiration from British uh, storytelling, as you say, Gargantua. Yeah, he also, uh, he's he's obviously a big classicist. I knew that even before reading about his biography. Because um, he re- references Greek uh, legends and philosophers and, uh, you know, Roman history and stuff all the time, mm-hmm. like constantly. Right. Uh, the third book is basically everybody saying something, then justifying what they said with some anecdote from classical history. Yeah, that's we should we should mention that even right from the beginning, uh, it it seems like it's a parody of pompous speakers at the time who like to cite a lot of references and a lot of like you're saying Rabelais is that, but I get the definite impression that this was. The, a thing that a lot of people oh yeah did. yeah that too but i he he knew enough about the references to do that so. right and and the um like there's a one point where he starts uh into uh, penurge and uh a scholar get into basically a rap battle uh and the scholar just keeps coming up with crazier and crazier words uh actually i <laughs> i wrote it down here hang on uh, uh can you read this because i'm oh, i no. can't read these words yeah yeah no that's fine um uh uh, thou comest from Paris, then, said Pantagruel, and how do you spend your time, then, you, my masters, the students of Paris? The scholar answered, We transferitrate the sequin at the dilical and crepuscal. We deambulate by the compites and quadrives of the herb. We, U-R-B, we despumate the lati- lat- latial verbosination, and like verisimilary lupinares, and in a Venerian ecstasy inculcate our veretres to the pentissime recesses of the pudens of the amacabilissim meritricules. <laughs> so it's just like needless, again, it's ambiguate, embiggening it with their cromulent performance. Um, <laughs> he, like, I, like uh, we deambulate by the competes and quadrives of the herb just seems to mean we walk around the city, as far as I can tell. <laughs> so they're just doing it as... Oh, it reminds me of uh, of uh, frequent bits from Yes Minister, where, um, right. not the made-up words, but that... Um, uh, yeah. Sir Humphrey would always just say things in the most complicated way possible, like uh, yeah. uh, one whom your present interlocutor is in the habit of referencing by means of the perpendicular pronoun. Right. Yeah. Which means exactly. Him. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that's or me, but yeah, that's been a thing in sort of classical comed- comedy for a long time, and that is definitely what they're what he's doing there, and he's making fun yeah. of scholars using fancy words a lot, but even even. Um, like the the intro to the to the first couple books both read as if he's sort of as if he's giving a fancy lecture but also as if he's drunk in a bar talking to everyone they all read like that yeah <laughs> like he literally addresses people as my fellow drinkers and all that kind of stuff yeah so he's, um, he's make that's that's anyway it does make it a little bit slow going when you're reading it unfortunately for a modern audience um but. i didn't have much problem with it but uh in terms of readability, uh, though I probably missed a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. but uh, I didn't, because I read all five, so I guess I got used to it after a while. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's um, you can, like, it's, the thing is, because it's not about the plot, it's about all these weird little jokes and side, like, references and 
verbal dr jokes that he's making, that is kind of the point of the story. So you can lose, all, you know, you feel like you're missing a lot of it by just reading it straight up that way. As yeah, one of the idea. islands they go to is um, uh, two uh, people at war, and they're both sausage people. Mm -hmm. And they're like human sausages. Right. Um, and um, the war is stopped when one of their gods uh, flies over, and it's a pig named Carnival, a giant pig named Carnival with wings, mm -hmm. and it drops mustard on all of them. <laughs> Yes. I, I don't know what that means. Well, it, that's interesting because that one I almost like as a know. like if it's satirizing anything or if it's just being ridiculous. Like Carnival, actually, I you know it, it trans it can be translated from French as uh, the the flesh that the flying flesh. The flying oh, okay, meat. that. Um, yeah, okay, I missed that. So yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Or if you like, it can be. Tr I mean, the famous Candyman sequel, Farewell to the Flesh. That is actually a translation for Carnival. That's the more common uh, explanation, which is you know you say goodbye to the flesh because you're starting Lent. Uh, but it also like in the same way that flee flee this place can 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 be fly fly this place it's got the same kind of multiple meaning there so you can you can make it a pun as you know the flying flying meat <laughs> okay so I think yeah that's that makes when, a lot more sense yeah so there so that's just a that's one example where i actually do see what he's doing with that <laughs> that joke basically okay yeah. i don't speak french at all so <laughs> yeah well there's um, I, I can guarantee you there's a ton of stuff like that throughout the books that is just going over my head and obviously all of our heads but and plus of course it's you know french of four, 400 years ago too which is probably shifted and adapted in different ways so it's not it doesn't land as hard as it would otherwise mm -hmm. um uh yeah yeah there, there's um uh the fifth book has a bit where they uh it has a contradiction from the uh four, fourth book i think um, cause both describes unicorns in a, a different way. So, um, okay. the fifth book, uh, describes them as having, uh, their horns are floppy and get hard when they, uh, are going to fight, which obviously has phallic, uh, things, but, uh, Oh, you're the... right. It does. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think you can always anyway. go with rabble <laughs> with the sexual and, and double entendre of everything in the book. It, yeah. Um, I, I, the fourth book ends with Panerge uh, pooping his pants. So, again. Um, <laughs> Great literature, folks. Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the classics of, of literature in any language, one of the founding novels. Uh -huh. um, yeah. 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 Um, just like Don Quixote, speaking just of, like uh, Shakespeare. <laughs> they all have yeah. lots of raunchy nonsense in them this is a little more obvious than i think shakespeare sure uh, yeah it, like even shakespeare it, which can be filthy um like it's not even the language issue because this is would have the same problem like this is just you know straight up you know people crapping themselves <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um so uh some more um uh influences that uh, rabelais had um in the uh, university of montepeller's Montpellier, sorry, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Montpellier, yeah. Uh, in their faculty of medicine, uh, uh, graduating medics have to uh, undergo a coronation, or can't undergo a coronation without taking an oath under his robes. <laughs> under, under Pantagruel's robes? Uh, Rabelais' robes. Oh. From when he was there. What? <laughs> what, what so wait, what does that mean? Like... You Literally, have to stand yeah. under the robes that uh, uh, that Rabelais actually wore uh, and take an oath. And you can't <laughs> okay. graduate without doing that. Uh, so, wait, he's standing on, like, a pillar? And how does that work? I'm just, no, I'm no not... just the robe itself. Like, you're supposed to stand under it. Because I was going to say, if, it's, if, if he had to literally stand there, then I can see how that would be filthy. <laughs> no, no, no. I was... <laughs> I was just saying, That's what I he thought was you were influential saying. there because he was, he was a doctor. Um, hey, baby, you want to graduate? You got to crawl under this robe right here. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, we're turning into him. Uh, let's yeah. see. There's also an asteroid named after him. Um, uh, in France, there's a, a phrase. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but it's it means uh, uh, in memory of a fra famous trick when the waiter pr presents the bill. 
It's apparently a reference to uh, Rabelais' uh, habit of getting out of paying a tavern bill when he had no money. <laughs> and you can, if you say that, they'll let you leave without paying? No, no, it's just what, what the waiter says when presenting the bill. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, nice. It apparently happens in France. I don't know. I've never been there. <laughs> well, um, there you go. Only in the classy places. <laughs> Uh, so this is getting a little off the rails. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, well, it's like a game of tennis, which Rabelais liked to compare his writings to a lot because apparently it was very popular back then. Uh, it was. So uh, I think our game. Caravaggio is... apparently uh, killed somebody over a tennis game. That's been disputed, but apparently that's. Uh, yeah, Henry VIII. That, that's tennis. a common story. That was thing. Yeah. Sorry. So well, our game is over. So um, let's wrap it up. Uh, this is Adam Prosser who communicates by signs with his hands, and Philip Rice, who solved the riddle of the furred law cats. Anyway, thanks to our producer, uh, Alex Ross, who tends to the Abbey of Thelemé, and Jack Furick, whose theme song will be inscribing on a tablet and burying for a thousand years. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone, we both have Patreons, and subscribers can listen to the show a week early. Uh, just look under Philip Rice or Adam Prosser at patreon.com or go to neversleepsnetwork slash series slash what dash mad dash universe for all the links that we're talking about here. We're also on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, if you sign up for a Patreon, you get comics, illustrations, and other stuff, which just helps us afford the hosting and recording costs of this show. Um, you can also get this podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcaster of choice. And if you enjoy it, please leave a review. It would help us if you'd spread the word about What Mad Universe, tell people about it, uh, link to us on social media, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's greatly appreciated if you can do that. Uh, now, in God's name, depart, and may he go along with you.